So good afternoon anyway and welcome to this book at lunchtime event on celebrity culture and the myth of Oceania 1770 to 1823 written by Dr Ruth Scobie. My name is Wes Williams, I'm the Knowledge Exchange Champion here at Torch and I'm delighted to welcome Ruth today to speak about this book. Um, also on the panel day today are Bridget Orr, Anna Senku, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, and Ros Ballester who will be chairing the discussion. At the end of the 18th century, metropolitan Britain was entranced by stories emanating from the furthest edges of its nascent empire. In this innovative study, Ruth Scobie shows how these multiple images of Oceana as a kind of emblem for empire were filtered to a wider British public through the gradual emergence of the new idea of fame. Commodified spectacle, commodified, commercial, scandalous, fame which bore in some respects a striking resemblance to modern celebrity culture, and which made figures such as Banks, Cook, Fletcher, Christian, and his fellow mutineers on Pitcairn Island into public icons. In a moment, I'm going to hand over to Roz, who will fully introduce the book and the rest of the panel. This will be followed by a brief reading by Ruth. Afterwards, our commentators will present their thoughts on the book, coming at it from their particular disciplines. We will then give Ruth the chance to respond to some of the points raised before enter entering into what I hope will be a fascinating discussion. The event will then conclude with questions from you, the audience. Um, and again, I can only apologise for starting it late. But it is nonetheless a great pleasure to be here to introduce the fourth book at lunchtime of this academic year. Book at lunchtime, as some of you will know, because I recognise your faces from previous events, is Torture's flagship event series, taking the form of fortnightly bite-sized discussions with a range of commentators. If you want to know more about what's coming next, please do look at our website and newsletter for the full programme for next term, which is already in place. All that's left for me to do now is to thank you all for coming and introduce our chair, Ros Ballister. She's Professor of 18th Century Studies in the Faculty of English and Lecturer and Tutorial Fellow at Mansfield College here in Oxford. Ros's research relates to story as an ethical experience from the late 17th century through to the mid 19th century especially in the popular novel and in the theatre, and she's had a good deal to do with Torch in relation to both of these areas. She has published widely on the novel and women's writing in the 18th century and is currently writing a book about the role of theatre in the invention of the novel over this period. Ros, I'll hand over to you Thanks and so look forward to it. Thank you. Are you all right if we stay seated? Um, you can see it all. Okay. This is a little bit easier, apart from that I'm dazzled. <coughs> Um, so I'm really thrilled to introduce Dr. Ruth Scobie and the two other um, commentators. Um, I've known Ruth since she came to Oxford in October 2013, having won the Andrew Mellon Foundation <coughs> Postdoctoral Research Fellowship in examining exploring celebrity that was housed here. Um, she went on to spend a year as a lecturer in English at Sheffield before returning to Oxford to take up the post of lecturer in 18th century literature at Mansfield College between 2017 and 2021. And if it looks like Mansfield College is colonising Oxford, then <laughs> so it is. <laughs> and we're delighted to do so. Um, uh, Ruth's research is interdisciplinary uh, between literature and art, art history in particular. It's global in scope and at the forefront of what has become known as celebrity studies and literary histories of empire. And I just thought I'd use two of her essays that you might not know to sort of set up, I think, what's really interesting about Ruth's research. Uh, she has a prize-winning essay of 2013 on Mary Shelley's Frankenstein in the Keith Shelley Review, and a 2018 essay called Foot Fox and the Mysterious Mrs. Grieve, Print Celebrity and Imposture in Intimacy and Celebrity in 18th Century Literary Culture, which is edited by Emma Jones and Victoria Jewell from Paul Grave. And they point to two directions in her research. The essay on Frankenstein identifies a new source for the representation in Frankenstein of pursuit across frozen tundra in an account by James King, who travelled previously with Cook, of a similar journey across eastern Russia in a sledge. It builds on this insight to note the imitation of acts of enforced friendship in accounts of Cook's first encounters in New Zealand and the death-bringing effect of those encounters of forced friendship um, in both Frankenstein and The Last Man. Uh, so it brings a, a sort of fascinating, a sort of um, oceanic perspective to, to Frankenstein. The second piece on foot and fox is a great piece of archival reconstruction from print and other sources, so turning to that other aspect of Ruth's work, which draws on 
um, the kind of proliferation of print in the 18th century to tell us more about how that shaped modernity and the idea of celebrity. Um, it looks at reports of the trial of the Honourable Elizabeth Grieve in 1773, who turned out not to be honourable at all, but a con artist, um, particularly engaged in political cons. And she relates Grieve to a woman called Elizabeth Willoughby, who was a con artist sentenced to transportation in 1748, and in turn to the activities of Samuel Foote, that now very well-known one-legged theatrical um, impresario. Um, so the book we're discussing today, Celebrity Culture and the Myth of Oceania in Britain, 1770 to 1823, is published by Boydell this year in the 18th Century series, and I'm a general editor of that series, and I must tell you, I worked really hard to persuade Ruth to publish it with us, because I really wanted it in our series. Um, I think it's a great edition and a great opening um, book for us, uh, one of our opening books. Um, and you'll find out why as we go on to discuss it. I thought I'd just read out one sentence that captures its core argument to help you feel a bit more grounded in relationship to it. Uh, so this is a sentence that says, the British metropolis between the 1770s and the first decades of the 19th century created a multivocal imperialist mythology of Oceania as the site of its own shadows. This book argues not only that this mythology was generated primarily in the media, of an emerging British celebrity culture, but also that it acted as a means of imagining, imagining and negotiating celebrities' novelty and confusion. Um, and I'm sure we'll talk, we will find out, I hope you'll find out a lot more about the book as we continue. So just to introduce our other um, uh, respondents, um, uh, Bridget Orr. Um, Professor Orr's enjoyed a distinguished international career between Victoria University of Wellington, Cambridge University, Cornell University, Princeton, Iowa, Fordham, Notre Dame, and now Vanderbilt, where she's associate professor. <coughs> and her achievements as a scholar are distinguished and individual. She's the ideal commentator, in fact, on Ruth's book. Uh, she's a native New Zealander who's lived and worked in the United States of America for many years. And she has two focuses. First, she works on writing about and by New Zealanders, Maori and Pacific Islanders. And she's published essays on the depiction of Tahitian women in the poetic reception of 18th century voyage literature and on formal aspects of Maori fiction. Um, and second, she sought to challenge, I think, the tendency in literary history to see the Middle and Far East and the Pacific as kind of blank spaces open to representation by Western and European civilizations. She's an interest in telling the global history of 18th century literature in English, in opening up the intellectual horizons, the imaginative geography, as Edward Said termed it, of English-speaking readers. So her first, a very important book, Empire on the English Stage, 1660 to 1714, came out in 2001, and very exciting that she has a new book coming out called British Enlightenment Theatre, Dramatising Difference, from Cambridge University in 2020. Um, and this book looks at how theatre circulated and publicised radical enlightenment ideas and has some wonderful information and insight into the importance of Freemasonry in the making of theatre as well. And Anna, Anna thank you, Dr Anna thank you, took her doctorate in April 1819 from Oxford University, from Mansfield College, um, where she was in receipt of funding from the John Hodgson <coughs> Fund. The thesis title is Made in the Media, Actresses, Celebrity and the Periodical Press in the Late 18th Century. And that thesis explores the way in which fan culture emerged around the figure of the actress in late 18th century Britain, and especially in news reporting of and about the theatre. Uh, she's also now a research assistant on um, two, at least two projects. Um, my own project, Opening the Edgeworth Papers. If you've got a moment after this, get to the Bodleian and see our exhibition in the Portrayal about the Edgeworths. Um, and she's also working on a project at Oxford Brooks, Elizabeth Montague and the Blue Stocking Circle. Um, sponsored by the AHRC and the Foyle Foundation. Um, and so when she's not transcribing 18th century women's letters, she works on and teaches 18th century drama, women's writing, and newspapers in fiction. Um, I'm going to hand over to Ruth to read to read us a bit. a bit from our book before we come back to some questions. Thank you. And, um, yeah, thank you particularly to Torch, um, not just for kind of holding this event, but also because most of the research for this book was done just down the corridor in uh, one, at a desk in one of the big workrooms. Um, and it was just such an amazing landing place for somebody arriving in Oxford for the first time as a postdoc with this kind of weird cross-disciplinary project. Um, 
I would never have got anywhere with it, I think, without the community at Torch and um, particularly kind of the, the support that was given to me even after the postdoc finished. <coughs> and also especially thank you to Ros, who, as well as being very nice just now, um, has been incredibly <laughs> encouraging all the way through and also lets me use her office um, to teach him, which is really useful. Um, so this book begins... Um, as you were explaining much better than I, I think I can, um, by setting up the idea that the particular sort of set of circumstances around the Cook voyages in the 1770s creates um, a particularly close association, um, a particular kind of dynamic in the metropolitan imagination between the places that Cook visits, which come to be understood as like a unified region, and the celebrity culture, which is emerging at the same time in Britain. Um, I thought I'd read a little bit from the third chapter rather than kind of try and explain the whole thing. Um, the third chapter has kind of moved forward in time a little bit from the Cook Voyages. It looks at retellings of the Bounty Mutiny, the best known of which is Byron's um, narrative poem, The Island, which is not particularly well known. But um, the chapter describes how all the publicity and speculation around the Bounty Mutiny helps to resurrect and transform <coughs> associations between celebrity and Oceania and turns the Pacific Islands into a setting not just for meditations on scandal and public knowledge, but also for thinking about the cost of celebrities' aggression and intrusiveness for an individual's sense of privacy and sense of self. Okay, so it says here, for Byron and many other metropolitans, the hunt for the mutineer Fletcher Christian provided a clear narrative of <coughs> famed persecution of a living subject. While representations of Cook's death were shadowed by, even as they loudly denied, the failure of celebrities to immortalise the hero within the metropolis, the story of the bounty suggested a more actively destructive relationship between private individual and public persona. Byron was too young to have been aware of the original incident, a 1789 mutiny against the captain of a small naval ship carrying breadfruit trees from Tahiti to the slave plantations of Jamaica. A minor and undignified episode amid the turbulence of contemporary global events, the mutiny might have been received in 1790s Britain as no more than another trivial embarrassment to an embattled admiralty. Instead, it came to revive many motifs of oceanic celebrity and eventually became established as a modern myth of empire and rebellion. This was partly because of Captain William Bly's feat of survival after being set adrift in an open boat by the mutineers. Bly seemed for a year or two to have succeeded through this feat in his ambition of being recognised as the heir to the heroic status of Cook, his former captain on the resolution. As questions were raised over Bly's brutality or incompetence though, the puzzles surrounding his antagonist Christian became the main focus of public curiosity. And Christian acquired something of the status of a romantic anti-hero. Like Cook, Christian had vanished from the metropolis into distant Oceania, leaving only an obviously mediated, unstable textual presence by which he could be known to the metropolitan public. In the striking physical absence of the mutineer, pamphlets, poems, books, and newspaper articles speculated on, fictionalized, and forged his life, private character, and motive, um, motives. Unlike Cook, of course, Christian was not, or was not known to be, dead and so could not be safely consigned to a Virgilian underworld of the poet's imagination. To write about Fletcher Christian was to judge, exploit, and fictionalise a living man. Again, unlike Cook, Christian had exiled himself voluntarily from the reach of metropolitan knowledge. For years, he was a fugitive from British authorities. The texts of his celebrity coincided with, and at times made use of, the invasive surveillance of naval discipline. That is, most of what newspaper readers and poets knew about him was the result of investigations designed to end with his execution. As a result, the aftermath of the mutiny could on the one hand be made to dramatise what Antoine Lilty calls celebrity as a form of persecution. Christian's <coughs> continued elusiveness, on the other hand, provided a fantasy of escape from the world of public knowledge into a sphere of mythology and permanent distance. Characterised by poets like Byron and Mary Russell Mitford, with images of disappearance and the dissolution of identity, the mutiny reflected the idea of Oceania as a space 
where metropolitan identities like Cook's were both preserved and dispersed by their appropriation as celebrity. In particular, the exiled and hunted Christian offered Byron a figure for his own experience of the intrusive power of public <coughs> celebrity. Thanks. I think we'll leave that there. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Um, I'm going to start by inviting Bridget to open the discussion. And we'll, we, will, we thought rather than all just talk a bit and then get responses, we put some questions to Ruth in turn and see how that works see, out. See, see if I can answer the discussion. <laughs> well, um, kia ora everyone. It is an absolute delight to be here. I would like to thank you, Ros, for inviting me and for your extraordinarily generous uh, introduction. And first of all, I would really like to say how extraordinarily apposite it seems to me that the publication of this book is occurring at a time that is known in Aotearoa as Tuia 250. In other words, this is the time when um, Indigenous peoples in, in New Zealand first encountered uh, Cook and the Endeavour Voyage. Mm. So over the last few months, um, the replica of the Endeavour has actually been traveling around Aotearoa <coughs> and stopping in at many of the places where the first mm. voyage actually arrived. <coughs> and as you can imagine, this has been, as the, the term itself, tuya, which means a kind of weaving, contact, you know, um, exchange, suggests, a, it's a contentious process. Um, and there have been, there was at least one place that refused to have the Endeavour visit. Mm. Yeah, so I think that there is is um, something you know remarkable about the fact that um, on both sides of the world, if you like, this is um, you know a, a very resonant moment for considering the issues that you raise in the book. And the first thing I'd like to say uh, about about the book is that I thought it was a, a, just a wonderful um, revelation of the way in which a previously, I think. Um, you know, neglected source in newspapers, print culture, um, has been brought to bear on what can look like quite a well-worked field. Mm. You know, I think that you've you've um, enriched uh, the our knowledge. Um, you know, very, really, very considerably. And the other thing that is is very striking to me is that along with um, your incorporation of the the popular print material is returning to texts like the island, you know, canonical mm. texts um, by canonical authors that, again, have not been, you know, um, fully considered. So <clears throat> that aside, the way that I was the, the provoked, of, or the question that I, one of the first questions I wanted to ask you was, um, <clears throat> given that I'm interested in a, a, a wide and equal survey of um, the global 18th century, I, I wondered about your, why you decided to focus on Oceania in particular, mm -hmm. um, why you seem to excerpt it from what you <coughs> refer to, you know, quoting uh, another author, as the scandal of empire. Right? You know, uh, the other territories in um, the, the British imperial purview, South Asia, mm -hmm. um, the Americas, also throw up lots of celebrities and you know mm -hmm. figures of, of notoriety so whether you know it's it's um you know clive and um uh taboo sultan for that matter Absolutely. you know so that was something that i wanted to ask you about you know rather than just thinking about oceania as a kind mm -hmm. of um soft pastoral in counterpoint to those perhaps more mm -hmm. problematic scenes of empire yeah, I mean, I do see this book as kind of a starting case study in what might be possible, rather than kind of mm -hmm, something mm -hmm. that's um, that, that I'm trying to make a claim that it was unique in that, that right. way. I think obviously there are ways in which it worked differently to right. to, to India. Um, uh, just to shamelessly plug another article, I have a piece in History Today, uh -huh. uh, which came out this month, which is actually does talk about Tipu Sultan and uh, the figure of the Nabob. Right. There's another way in which celebrity culture, um, and also about slavery, which is something that I mean, <coughs> that, that's the next project, yeah. is talking about the way that celebrity and um, the slave trade mm -hmm. work together. Is that these are both things that are being mm -hmm. publicised and advertised in the same newspapers, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. literally like next to each other on the page. Mm. Um, there is something, I think, to be honest, I saw this as kind of, because there's a, a relatively kind of small 
craze for Oceania that takes place in a kind of more manageable time frame mm -hmm. and within a relatively small number of texts. There was an element of it that was just, uh, this seemed like a manageable first project. Right. If I'm going to be completely pragmatic right. about right. it. Right. Um, there's something very interesting about the relationship between Oceania and novelty, mm -hmm. though, as well. And also the way that it's so distant. I mean, obviously, India is distant too, but it, there's a kind of movement um, which is possible in physical terms. You can travel to India, people go to India. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Whereas there's a really interesting moment when Oceania is really something that only exists for most people as an imaginative space in, right. if you're in Britain. Right. You aren't in the 1770s going to go to... Yeah. And that, that was what kind of interested me first when I started looking at Cook as a celebrity. <coughs> and then the story I wanted to tell was how does that change mm -hmm. as in this very short span of time yeah. in t sort of relative to most mm. imperial history, there's a kind of sudden shift mm. within a few decades and by the time it gets to the beginning of the 19th century um, it is kind of both an imaginative space and a real space mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but that seemed to be kind of as I say kind of something that could be seen more easily just because of the kind of brevity of the, mm. the history. At that moment yeah I mean I like the idea it makes sense to me that celebrity might be seen as part of the ideological, you know, mechanisms of empire itself. So, you know, that, as you say, this is a particular case study yeah. rather than something that is distinct from um, discourse around the Americas or, or South Asia. And following up on your point, of which I suppose if you took it the other way and sort of said, what does it mean to bring Oceania to celebrity studies mm -hmm. rather than to take yes. celebrity mm -hmm. studies to Oceania? Well, one of the things that I found really interesting and exciting about the book was to sort of say, at one point you say celebrity studies can be a bit parochial, and there is a kind of parochial in trouble. celebrity <laughs> yeah. studies. I, I mean, I think yeah. you're probably right, because it often there's a kind of tendency to make celebrity studies something to do with extraordinary people or performers, actors, do you see? <laughs> so the yeah. special, whereas what you do here is say, here are ordinary people put in extraordinary or strange and, and unusual historical circumstances mm. that in a way celebrity becomes something that is rather foisted on them and is fact, in fact is premised on their absence. Yeah, so it's about um, not being yeah. Christian mm -hmm. Fletcher's absence. Mm -hmm. So it does something to our understanding of celebrity studies, which moves away from the idea of someone making their fame to the sort of problem that fame might be something yes. that's mm. owned by the media that's, mm. that's foisted and inflicted mm -hmm. on, mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. absent mm. figures. Mm. Um, I suppose along with that, there, then there, there came for me a kind of question about the extent to which Oceania starts to, to be figured as something that is just a construct of a metropolitan imagination in yes. London. Yes. I, I wanted to sort of raise a theorist I like, and I often quote Father Tarsing, I'm sure, uh, uh, Wendy Belcher's idea of discursive possession, that even if you do not go to a place, uh, she's talking about mm. Johnson's Rasselas, and the way in which Ethiopian <coughs> African culture, folklore, is kind of seeping into Johnson's consciousness through a Jesuit account of, of Abyssinia. <laughs> He's mm. not there. And she's sort of saying, we shouldn't just see this as an imperial yeah. displacement. There is a way in which that pre there is a presence even in that lack of actual contact. Yes, I mean, uh, one of the things that interests me <laughs> is the way that Celebrity, to me, see the relationship between a, a reader, a person, a fan, mm -hmm. and a celebrity seems to me to be kind of closer to, to a relationship to a place. It's a real place, mm -hmm. but it's an imagined place than, say, to like a fictional character. Because mm -hmm. there is that existence of a material individual, even if they're not present. Mm -hmm. So it becomes about absence and presence rather than about like um, a kind of illusion character yeah. if you see what I mean yeah. mm -hmm. so in the same way that there is a Tahiti even if you're treating it in a completely kind of fantastic pastoral way mm -hmm. there is a Tahiti in the way that there isn't an arcade like an arcade. a kind of arcade mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. now I'm now going like probably there was an arcade but you know what I mean um, <laughs> <laughs> my glasses are so great um, and, and similarly there's you know when you're talking about Fletcher Christian he's not here but there is a real person and so that does something which is different to talking about the ancient mariner, 
Mm. Um, that, that, that seemed to me why it was so important to start thinking about um, the imperial imagination in relation to celebrity, which seems like a dynamic which is very important for a particular idea of how mm. you can relate to the world, mm -hmm. a particular sort of knowledge of the world. Um, yeah. Anna, did you want to come in? Yeah, if I, I mean, <laughs> this book feels like a really important intervention into a lot of the things that have become established truths in, in um, celebrity studies because you shift... Uh, some of the expected ideas about taxonomies of fame, like Captain mm. Cook <laughs> blows out of the water the dichotomy between uh, current celebrity and posthumous fame. And I think that, and that whole relationship is really important um, because a lot of books, even today, on celebrity studies kind of stick to a, a fundamental difference between the two. Um, and then shifting from personalities and fashioning an individual fashioning their celebrity to something wider using the newspaper and, and my own interest is in the newspaper and I kind of uh, want to hear your thoughts on how you even approached it because if you don't know much about newspapers in the 18th century I mean they are bizarre they are inexplicable in terms of their content a lot of the time so how did you like methodologically begin to I sat them? I sat in that office down there um as a laptop and I went through newspapers Kind of I kind of worked out a bunch of keywords for stories that I wanted to follow and then just kind of read everything, <coughs> all the newspaper coverage um, as far as I could from one stage to another, which sounds very limited, but actually what happens is you end up kind of finding lots of side notes. There's a kind of, um, kind of proximal reading that seems to happen around newspapers, which I'm sure you found the same thing, that you start reading and then you, it becomes interesting what, what the, the story you're reading is next to. Mm. Yes, yeah. that's happening at the same time and you're constantly finding these interesting kind of proximities um, and yeah it, it, I spent like months <laughs> reading newspapers and I think it's, I mean I don't know if this is a book that could have been written without the kind of digitisation of material that mm -hmm. um, just allowed me to read mm -hmm. far more widely than would have been possible if I'd been sitting with the mm. material. And I know there's kind of a loss there as well, but um, in terms of scope, I wanted to do something slightly different. So for those who haven't read the book, there's a wonderful section, I can't, I can't even remember which chapter, it's the first chapter, I think, when Ruth works her way through particular um, runs of newspapers to tell you how many times a particular celebrity name Occurs it has an enormous, context. enormous um, spreadsheet. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and it comes out with some wonderful stuff that I think we, I hadn't sort of thought about. That actually, women, female celebrities are quite low yeah. down your yeah. list of, of hits. <laughs> we yeah. often think of celebrities as something that's associated with, with female performance, but actually they're not this forming was, a significant and, bulk in that. And, and theatrical celebrity really varied. <laughs> like, there's a, there is the theatre, but it's actually mm. there's more auctioneers than there are. Mm. Um, actors and actresses mm. um, and so it was just I was just trying to kind of get away from the problem with celebrity like celebrity history is that there's something really tempting about studying people who are still famous now but that can be really distracting I think from who were, who was actually famous then mm. so my mm. first kind of challenge that I set myself was to try and work out actually who was famous in mm -hmm. the 1770s mm. and 1780s and 1790s mm. and who do we just think was famous because they happen to have been recorded in text that survived mm -hmm. it's easy to think that if you've got a kind of Reynolds portrait that that must have been the most famous person in the country but actually there's loads of people who kind of got lost um, because it's a, a more ephemeral form. If I could ask a question um, about uh, celebrity history coming at it from a uh, I think you know slightly different perspective I was interested that there wasn't a celebrity from Aotearoa yeah. And one of the celebrity visitors I thought about is um, a Napui chieftain called Hongahika, who visited with a missionary called Thomas Kendall in 1820. And he came to Oxford where he um, helped compile a Māori dictionary and he met the king and he was given, you know, a great many um, gifts. And uh, when he uh, sailed back to New Zealand. He sold most of them off in Sydney and bought 600 muskets, which he then used in uh, Northland to massacre a good number of uh, another iwi, Ngāti Whātua. Mm. So to me, that's a, a very interesting kind of 
mm. um, account of the what you might call the the shadow side of celebrity, where mm. it is commodified and deployed in um, a, a colonial, you know, yeah. uh, environment <coughs> in really very you know, <coughs> terms. And I, I wondered if uh, you know, obviously. Um, your concern is the that kind of you know ideological play in the metropolis, but I was I wondered if you did think about these colonial theatres. Obviously, Australia, yes, mm -hmm. but um, where celebrity might have other and really quite obviously malign effects. Yeah, I mean, I think Kate Fullage's book on um, visitors to the metropolis, like, and 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 Robbie Richardson's book actually as well, um, both do really good work with sort of starting to look at some mm -hmm, of those figures. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, it was something that I kind of struggled with because I think Omai is always held up as the the figure and I kind of call him Omai yeah. because I was trying to kind of, yeah. I was interested in him as a print figure mm -hmm, and mm -hmm, again as an imaginative, mm -hmm. an imagined person rather than kind of the, the material individual. Mm -hmm. um, and Omai is actually one of the only people that really people have got to, or started kind of getting to grips with the difference between the two and how that might um, work together, but it's something certainly that there's a lot more work mm. to be to be done with. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, Kate Fullage's argument is that the metro metropolitan imagination sort of loses interest in those figures. Mm. Um, that that people like um, Benelong don't get the same level of interest, mm -hmm. and I'm not mm -hmm. sure I entirely agree, kind of, mm -hmm. with the detail of that. But I think there is a sort of move, a loss of interest in the. Mm -hmm. In, in individual visitors, it, it's mm. Mm. so that the, they kind of slip out of as as Oceania is a place, um, sort of slips out of the, of the metropolitan imagination as a kind of fantasy pastoral, mm. and becomes instead something that's kind of fairly mundane about economics and politics and mm. squabbling with the Americans. Mm. Um, the big people who come there from there are also kind of regarded as more mundane and as actually diplomats and. Mm. Rather than as as my kind of, mm -hmm. as as sort of some kind of romantic symbol. Mm. Mm. I don't know. If, I don't think that answers your question. But. Mm. And the other thing this book did for me that, that it made me think. I'm, I'm someone who spent I think I spent my entire career trying to write a, an account of where the novel comes from. <laughs> so that's sort of Oriental tales, women's writing, yeah. now the theatre, <laughs> kind of, and and, and also recognising that in a way. The kind of resilience of the term novel comes from its its its. I mean, it's it's kind of lack of denotative um, <coughs> um, specificity, really. <laughs> the, yeah. the, the term novel just simply means the new, and that what this book does partly is kind of make make us think beyond genre, and in terms of recognizing how mm. mobile that term is, in terms of the new worlds, but also the novel novels of novelty that the theatrical performances are also talked about mm. as novels and novelties um and and new um so one of the things your book does is put sort of pantomimes ballets monologues and poetic sort of fictional voices sort of reverse ethnography these kind of fictional letters all together in the same space in relationship to, to Oceania makes us sort of recognize that there's a kind of network network or matrix of claims to newness Mm. which we might want to connect to modernity um, and to our ideas of the novel rather than having a kind of generically, you know, for those of us who are literary critics in the room, a sort of tendency to, um, to, to produce sort of specialist silos that sort of mm. tell us you know, that we look at the drama or we mm -hmm, look at mm -hmm, the novel, mm -hmm. we take novel to mean narrative, prose, print, fiction. Mm. Um, so that, that, I think that's a really kind of... Um, it's challenging, but it also has a sort of similar effect to that sense that you opened it up so beautifully with the sort of, I, I love that image you have of Cook as a kind of figure who is um, quite literally dispersed and dismembered across <laughs> yeah. the coast of the beach. <laughs> it's quite and that's violent murder, but that's also what happens to his fame. Mm. And that part, I suppose the thing I wanted to, to sort of ask you about was that sort of sense that in a way that makes fame more resilient and mm. gives it a, a longevity and a kind of capacity to survive. Strangely, dismemberment and, dis and dispersal 
produces a kind of fragmentary survival that seems to have more resilience mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, than, than I mean, a single figure who is somehow mm. perpetually reproduced. Yeah, I mean, thing. again, it's trying to get away from that, like, hierarchies of fame mm -hmm. and the idea that, like, you can have fame that is for good deeds or for, for being, support, you know, um, supported by the state will be more permanent than yeah. um, celebrity. Yeah. Um, which actually, that, that's something that people kind of worry about all the time, but that just mm -hmm. means that it's actually not possible to tell the difference, if only because celebrity always insists that it's not celebrity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I mean, the, the way I got into this was looking at Cook, right at the beginning, of, actually in my master's for a class presentation. Mm -hmm. um, I, I wanted to know how Cook got famous. I wanted to look at him as a kind of figure of, you know, this imperial he hero. How did that happen? Um, and everyone sort of assumes, and I'd sort of assumed that, you know, people put up statues and the state decided that he was going to be a hero. Um, and, and that didn't happen at all. Um, he really wasn't regarded as someone who could usually be made famous or who sort of deserved fame in that way. And so instead what happens is celebrity <coughs> constructs this figure who is actually much more durable yeah. in a way. But he's precisely only interesting to the first people who create that celebrity because he doesn't seem durable. Mm -hmm. As I say, like all the texts are worried about the fact that he's not going to be remembered, and mm -hmm. that he doesn't have a tomb, he doesn't have a kind of mm -hmm. um, commemorative presence. And at the same time, all the people who were being commemorated as heroes by the state have now almost completely yeah. vanished yeah. and yeah. are not remembered. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's... You really showcase celebrity as a kind of participatory culture and not, yeah. not that top-down um, mm -hmm. idea. And I, I wanted to return, I suppose, to that idea of absence versus um, presence that we, we touched on earlier, because a lot about uh, celebrity is often about that intimacy between people. But that's, you show that as so imagined you know, here um, in, in lots of real ways because the people aren't doing anything in London. A lot of the stuff I look at is really domestic, <laughs> parochial. Thanks, Ruth. <laughs> There's something wrong with being parochial. <laughs> but I, I just wonder what you think some of this does to our notions about celebrity and that intimacy. Do you think, how do you think it might challenge that narrative? Or do you think it's still there, but it's just presented differently? I mean, that's, that's sort of the fundamental thing, isn't it? That the idea that, um, that, that celebrity creates the illusion of presence but by sort of by definition the presence has to be illusory mm -hmm. um, you can't actually be the relationship with the celebrity is never actually about intimacy it's always about a kind of imagined intimacy they're not really there even when they are there they're not really there because but they're really faced with it with these as yeah when, when you're going so, to the theatre and you're in front of an actual famous person and you can, yeah I can see how you imagine the, your closeness but this is but so yeah so some of the stuff that I found most compelling was the <coughs> figures like Fletcher Christian or Cook who are just kind of really glaringly absent mm -hmm. that, that that's what actually what they're famous for is for not being there but at the same time what celebrity does is create this kind of imagined presence this imagined closeness mm -hmm. Although in Cook's case, you do have published journals or what yeah. purport to be the published journals, which are, you know, scandalous and actually, you know, in the, in the case of Hawksworth's yeah. version, mm -hmm. um, filled with rather disturbing phenomena like, you know, free love, infanticide, mm -hmm. cannibalism, that yeah. sort of thing. So um, that seems to me to offer at least, a, you know, one potential proximity. Um, yeah. Um, as, again, it's sort of too much presence in a way like there's mm -hmm. too much knowledge that, that that's what people find scandalous about Hawksworth is not that he's kind of writing this stuff down but that it's published so that everyone can see it mm -hmm. um it, there's there's lots of responses that are kind of well it would have been fine for Cook to act like this or for Banks to act like this the problem is that celebrity make kind of, kind of makes that present in the metropolis and mm -hmm. that's bad mm -hmm. by the time you get to Fletcher Christian what seems to be compelling about him is that there's really nothing there at all, mm. except this kind of hold that he leaves, mm -hmm. um, that nobody understands why he's acted in the way he's acted, nobody understands where he's gone or what it's for. So it's kind of pushing that to its, its extreme, I think. Mm. But for me, that does come back to this question again about where you put agency, mm. whatever we want to call agency, political agency or personal agency or sexual agency or, or 
um, imperial agency, because it seems to me you, you could. So one, so let's be really. Uh, if we're being tough on your book, you might just say, <laughs> okay, so we've taken celebrity away from individuals, from from making it themselves. Um, I'm thinking about someone like you know Julia Fawcett's argument about mm. overexpression in acting in the 18th century that 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 actors respond to the demand to be known by apparently performing themselves in ways that actually make them more illegible, so they protect mm -hmm. themselves. And that's a kind of agency. There's a way in which, you have been tough on your book, you might sort of say, actually, what we land up with is a version of the absolute determinism of print through its ephemerality and its mm. incoherence. Do you know what I mean? That actually, as a result, there is no, you know, in some ways, it's back to, you know, it's a kind of Foucauldian prison <laughs> where there is no centre to power and that makes it all the more pervasive yes. and impossible to resist. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, I think that's, that's an argument about empire, I suppose, is that, it, that celebrity actually allows a kind of more powerful form of empire precisely mm -hmm. because it's um, working through an authority which isn't overthrowable because it's just... Yes, it's not a single point of yeah. origin that you can say. As they, you know, yeah. argue, it's why arguing with Twitter is harder than arguing with one politician, right? That's yeah, yeah. Because it's absolutely. just multiple voices. I mean, I, I feel like it, it sort of is a literary question that, you know, when, when a student say kind of, okay. what did, how much agency does the author have over their text? Mm -hmm. um, where is the agency in, in a novel? Mm -hmm. um, I kind of see that as the same question as kind of a celebrity persona. Mm -hmm. How much agency does the, um, does the, the actual person have? And the answer is like sometimes a lot, um, and sometimes they're crafting things really deliberately, and sometimes they're not. Mm. But in the end, I guess for me, what's interesting <coughs> is is the workings of that text rather than mm. who's controlling mm. it necessarily, and how the the reception of that text is is influenced by mm. the perception of control. I mean, apart from anything else, as Anna and I have discussed at length, like it can be very difficult to tell who's controlling these texts. When you read something in a newspaper, you don't about a kind of an article of gossip for example you don't know who wrote it mm. um you can kind of have a guess but but mm. ultimately it might be by the person in, in question or mm. it might be mm. by somebody who hates them or it might be someone who's trying to promote them it's mm -hmm. not you've got one example in here of where you found the you got the draft of a person yes. and that's amazing because you hardly ever have hard evidence of a person mm. yeah their banks, own banks his archive includes this letter um written in the third person that he's planning to, if it's in his handwriting, that says, um, Sir Joseph Banks has been very badly treated. And since, <laughs> since he won't write to the papers to let people know what's really happening, I'm going to have to anonymously. Yeah. And, uh, he, and it does appear in the newspaper later on in a different form, but there is no way you would know that the letter that appears in the newspaper was by Banks unless you had that mm. draft. Mm. Which leads me to suspect that lots of other letters in the newspaper have perhaps <laughs> not what they pretend to be. I'm very aware of time, and I realise I must yeah, invite I some um, thoughts from the <laughs> audience as well before we close.